Good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Eli Kasai, based at the University of Namibia. Um, I'm a senior lecturer here. Uh, so Ketevi introduced me as a professor. I'm nowhere near a professor, at least not yet. But I know what he meant. Um, I know in other parts of the world, professor means somebody who actually lectures. So when uh, people in my university saw me being advertised, oh, when did you become a professor? Oh, no, you never told us. Um, yeah, so they didn't realize that was actually, um, you know, a different way of doing things. Anyway, so I'm going to talk about um, multi-wavelength studies of active galactic nuclei. Um, I'm really just continuing from where um, Mariana left off. Mariana did a very good job of uh, introducing the topic on AGN. Um, so I'm just, I'm just basically continuing from there. So the first part, after I give a bit of my bio, I will just uh, do a, a bit of a recap on what Mariana already talked about, in case some people were not part of her talk. And then I'll veer off specifically to blazers, um, which are a type of AGN. All right, so um, this is the outline of my talk. So I'll give you a bit of my biography. I hope it will be um, short enough and within the time that I'm allocated for that. And then I'll I'll introduce active galactic nuclei again, as I said, just building off from where my, uh, Mariana left off, and talk a little bit about what distinguishes the various kinds of AGN from each other, and then I'll be off to talking more about blazers, their emission models, and what challenges are faced at the moment, and then I'll finish off with how the future Cherenkov telescope array and some other multi-wavelength um, land campaigns will kind of help us, you know, um, resolve some of the challenges we face with understanding AGN, specifically for me, um, lasers. Right, then I'll conclude. Okay, so Ketevi asked us to talk a little bit about ourselves uh, for about five to 10 minutes. So I figured I'll just give people, um, you know, a bit of my educational background and then where I've worked and where I currently work and then what this sort of research that I'm, I'm focused on. So I, I did my BSc at this place, the University of Namibia, um, some 20 years ago now, about 20 years ago, quite a long time. Um, it's not always this green, uh, usually this green in, in December. People who were here uh, 2018 for the African School of Physics, the fifth, the fifth uh, installment, would attest that they did not find it this green. <laughs> um, so, um, so then I did my BSc honors and MSc and PhD at UCT. Uh, many of you will be familiar with UCT probably. Uh, very nice looking university, as you can see. And I did that between these years, 2010 to 2017. This is the South African Astronomical Observatory where I did a part of my research, very good researchers here, in case some of you are interested in collaborating with some people. They are very good researchers. I know Dayen is doing AGN. I know there are some people here that are doing AGN, like, um, the SALT operations manager does AGN. All right, and then, so from 2010, when I finished um, BSc honors at UCT, I got a scholarship from the Square Kilometer Array, South Africa, which now is called Sareo. And these are the Meerkat telescopes, which are the precursors for SK telescopes. And they took this unprecedented image very high resolution image of the center of our galaxy, um, which is currently um, the most high resolution image that we have available of the galaxy. So it's just the array. 
And then I also spent uh, time at the African Institute for Mathematical Sciences during my studies, starting from MSc. So AIM South Africa is um, this yellow building here, basically, with the Atlantic Ocean there in the background, very beautiful place. So in this picture, Ames is located there. So they're very active. So for the, for the students, for people that are still studying or people especially in undergrad or want to you know, continue doing masters in mathematical sciences and, and you know, machine learning and things like that, it will be a good choice um, uh, or it will be an option to think about. Um, yeah, so um, they train some good students from this, 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 this facility. So then I spent, um, during my PhD, my master's and PhD, I spent some time at the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation and in, um, in, at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. I can assure you this is not, uh, this building is not constructed like the Tower of Pisa. Um, I think the photographer was just, uh, maybe didn't have skills for the camera, was not good enough. So um, I actually spent, three months at this institution during my master's and then three months again, my PhD in 2012 and 2013. So um, yeah, so that's, that's about my educational journey. Um, with work, I'm currently a senior lecturer at UNAM starting last year in September. Before that, um, I was a lecturer from 2016. Um, and then I've interned at the OAD um, and back in the day, I used to work as a commercial analyst for NAMPOWER, which is the electricity supply company for Namibia. So this is UNAM again. So this is the Office of, the, um, Office of Astronomy for Development, where I was an intern. Okay. So those that uh, might be familiar with, um, or, um, or those that work in astronomy might know Kevin Govinda. He's the one heading this office. It's located at the South African Astronomical Observatory. Little building, but a lot of good things happen in there. So I was working as an intern between 20, 2013 and 2015. So we have very good collaborations about you know, developing astronomy projects, especially for developments around the world, basically. So then this is NAMPOWER electricity supply company for Namibia. I never worked at any of these places, the hydro station, coal fired station. I was just sitting in this building here because I was doing um, finance. I was working as a commercial analyst. So that was 2005, 2009. Mm -hmm. Then I resigned from that and came back to academia. Yeah. Okay, so um, with research, I am, uh, I'm involved in uh, some CTA work, specifically determining redshifts for blazers. Um, so I, I had this project, this part, this part of the project that involved uh, using the Southern African Large Telescope, the other telescope doing uh, spectroscopic measurements to get redshifts. Um, and then, uh, so basically, this is the, the Cherenkov telescope array in the future. It's not built yet. Um, so this is the SALT observatory or the Sutherland observatory where SALT is located. SALT is right here. Um, so we use this to measure redshifts for blazers, which is very key for uh, blazer studies and AGN studies. Is, I'll, I'll elaborate a, lo a little bit more on that later on. So then I am doing data science. I have a passion for data science. So I'm, I'm actually uh, doing the data science intensive program for Africa, where we're basically doing quite a lot of machine learning, artificial intelligence and that type of thing. So um, at the moment, it's quite hard to balance life because this is also taking up quite some time. Um, but I'd recommend um, the, the, either the ASP alumni or the students, look out for this kind of program. I'd really recommend this program. I've learned so much doing this in terms of, you know, how to apply data science techniques to big data that we have in astronomy, for example. In astronomy, we produce lots and lots of data, and so is astro 
Astro Park, um, I mean, particle physics also, CERN, you guys produce lots of data as well. So this program is giving lots of techniques of how to deal with that. It's particularly useful for me because I have students that um, are using, you know, uh, lots of data where they need for, uh, data science skills. So I can guide them very well. At the moment it's not in a walk in the park, it's quite tough. So um, that's that. Um, I uh, hope I did, that didn't take up too much time. So now I can get back to um, what I want to talk about in terms of science and uh, what was advertised. So just to quickly go over what you saw with Mariana again. Um, so you saw this um, accepted model uh, of the, the popularly accepted model of, of an AGN where you have these various components, basically the obscuring torus black hole, the jets, um, which are basically relative, relativistic particles that are being beamed out by the central supermassive black hole. And then you have here being the broad line region and the narrow line region. And um, so in this model, it really depends on your viewing angle um, that tells you what type of AGN you're looking at. So from observational features, luminous AGNs have been found to fall in these three categories. You have CFIRTs, quasars, and radio galaxies. You heard a lot about that last week from Miriana. Um, where you have the differences among these being C fit one has narrow uh, narrow lines, narrow emission lines and broad emission lines in their spectra, where C fit twos only have narrow lines. And then I'm not gonna go into the details of the luminosities that associated with each one of these um, uh, uh, different types of AGN. Um, Mariana did a good job covering all of that. And then you have the, these radio galaxies, which are uh, uh, um, classified into two classes where you have Panner of Riley 1 and Panner of Riley 2, where for the one, um, you have the urge being darkened. That is, you know, the jets, as you go away from the active galaxy or the, 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 um, the the black hole, as you go from the central part uh, away, as you go to the edge of the jets, they, the, the, the luminosity or the brightness decreases and at the edges, it is dark. Whereas with the funnel of Riley, it's the other way around. It keeps getting brighter and brighter as you go to the edges. The edges are brighter um, and they are usually one-sided. They usually have one-sided um, um, jets all right so um okay so again you saw this uh um model or you saw this image in miriam's talk here is really just an illustration of how you get these different types of agn and it really just depends on the your viewing angle so if you're viewing from, if, you, if you're viewing directly along the jet, so if the, the jet intersects your line of sight, um, then what you see is um, a, a, a BLAC, which is a blazer or an optically vari variable, um, um, optically valent variable, which together I call these blazers. And if you view from that angle, you see a radio like, like quasi-stellar, radio loud quasi-stellar object. And then depending on the angle, basically um, you will end up with any one of these types of, uh, of AGN, all right? So, um, excuse me. Okay. So, um, multi-wavelength of AGN observations. Again, um, you saw this in Mariana's talk. 
These are objects that basically emit um, radiation across the entire electromagnetic spectrum. Um, so you have in the radio, you have some data points there, there you have the lowest luminosity uh, data points. And then in the infrared, you have some data points in the optical, some data points, and you carry on going all the way up to gamma rays. So they basically emit across the entire electromagnetic spectrum and we can observe them with various uh, ground-based telescopes in different EM bands and so forth. Um, so different EM bands uh, observe different uh, parts of the AGN. Um, the Cherenkov observes the high, uh, high energetic process, very high energy processes of the, of, of the AGN and so forth. Um, and so it goes just as um, Miriana basically explained. So just a quick recap of all of that stuff. Now um, I wanna move over to uh, blazers specifically, um, which is a field that is actually, um, I've only gotten into my training or my background is actually in optical astronomy specifically observational cosmology. Um, so, but this is something that I actually started getting into um, because the work that I was involved in with the dark energy survey where I was um, doing supernova observations, that project came to an end. Um, and I just feel uh, it's a bit detached for me because uh, I don't actually, um, the role that I was playing in there be, kind of diminished. Uh, so, but then I'm at home, I'm, I came back, you know, to Namibia and I've, you know, been closer to HES, so being part of the HES collaboration, now the CTA collaboration. So I've started venturing into this field as well. So this is what I'm actually involved in, at least from um, the point of uh, taking redshift measurements. And um, so at the moment we've, uh, over 200 very high energy sources have been detected, both extragalactic so, and Eli, galactic. There is a question. Oh, okay. Uh, the journey sure. has a question. Yes. Like using uh, HES, how many blazers are you observed? How many blazers have we detected with HES? Yeah. Um, I can't tell you that at the top of my head, unfortunately, but I know that um, all of them combined has magic veritas. I'm, I'm going to have to look uh, to dig that up for you. I, I don't have it at the top of my head. Let me just quickly see if uh, Michael might be present here. Maybe he might know at the top of his head. Uh, yes, Michael is around. Michael, can do you do you maybe want to come in and, and mention um, how, how many lasers we've detected with S? My my guess would be in the thirties, but I'll send around a link in two or three minutes, which has a list of them. Okay, those sources are in low redshift or high redshift sources, right? They, they, they cover um, a, a range of redshifts up to intermediate redshifts. Okay. So uh, a blazers is a subset of the AGM? Yes. So uh, could you uh, maybe uh, clarify a little bit um, what characteristics will uh, specifically uh, distinguish the blazers from the general type of AGMs? Yes, sure. Um, let me just go back to this drawing again, uh, to this diagram again. Um, okay, let me just do this real quick. Right, so uh, Ketevi, and maybe to some other people who also uh, felt, oh, okay, now I also want to know that. Um, 
it really just depends on your viewing angle of this AGN model, of this accepted AGN model. Um, so if you are sitting over here, up here, all right, let me just see. You can see my cursor, that's right. Yes. And you have a, you have a telescope here, which means this, or this jet will be along your line of sight. So what you then, what you, the radiation that you, that you measure, um, that class classifies the, the type of AGN that you are dealing with as a blazer. And then if your viewing angle is um, along this side, what you measure is the BLRG, Broadline Radio Galaxy. And then if you are seated over here and you point and you're observing, this is your observing uh, position, what you'll measure is a CFIT-1 type of AGN. So it really just depends on the viewing angle um, towards the, or, or depends on your viewing angle of, of the source, of the AGN source that, that, that tells you what source you're dealing with. What yeah, so, so now, um, so when you make the observation, you know, what are the characteristics that particularly tell you that you want to classify this AGM as a blazer or as a quasar or and, and so forth? So the, the, okay. the distinguishing features that you see. Yes, yes very good. Um, luminosity is one of them, the, the brightness basically, but also uh, the characteristic, the spectral shape that you get um of the of the observation that you make that also tells you what you're dealing with um some some agn the spectral shape or at least the the the, the, the absorption and emission features and other features in their spectra are not present in others for example if you observe uh, if you observe the CFET one what you would see in there are narrow and broad lines I don't have a spectrum of that, and um, was in Miriana's talk. Whereas, if you were to observe a CFET two, what you what you would see is just a um, a narrow line in the spectrum. So those are some of the features that, that we basically use in um, in classifying these objects. Um, I think Dejene has uh, another comment or question. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, so as you mentioned, like. Galaxies can classify based on the orient that depend on the orientation angle. I yeah. think it's also we need to like to think about the obscuration towards the center of the supermassive black hole because when we see like uh, to towards the center of the, the supermassive black hole, the obscuration depend on the obscuration of the the dust. Like when we see the the creation disk, and yeah. so not only depend on the orientation angle. Rob, right, that's, that's exactly right as well. Um, yep. There was obscuration of the dust horrors um, and so forth also definitely plays a vital role in determining what you're looking at. Um, right. So Isaac, um, Isaac has some comment here. Isaac David, you want to you want to uh, talk about it? Uh, yes, uh, I think Eli also already mentioned that uh, the, the the SED which Eli showed those two humps uh, on I think it was the next slide. Uh, yeah, this this one coming up now. Uh, the observation list also looks at the, the shape of uh, the, the characteristics of the shape, as Eli said, and at the very high energy uh, part of it, they also look at the spectral index, uh, the, the, the value, the, basically the, the what gives you the gradient. So they have things like, if it is this steep, then it might be a Laser and, and, type, and things like that. And there's this other other um, 
variability variability uh, some some very these blazers many of them are very vi variable uh, and maybe they have measured some of them up to minute time scales so what is the variability uh, could you uh, explain that to us so i mean you know me uh, i'm not I'm not it, an expert like so, so your yeah. so your, your the variability would be the uh, your your light your light so called light curve how your luminosity changes as a function of time Okay. If, if you were able to observe it, uh, or, if you have, or monitor it over some extended period, then uh, the variability you can get ups and downs in in minute time scales I for see. some of these places. Uh, the one one maybe one thing about Hess is that many of these sources are seen uh, as point sources, so so uh, resolving the, the the entire shape. It's a bit of a problem. So I think very often the spectral shapes and the spectral index and, and stuff like that are used to categorize them. Yeah. But I can't give at the, at the moment the spectral index and, and so on, unfortunately. Okay, Professor Michael Bucket uh, um, sent some information uh, on the chat. Uh, Michael, do you want to say something about it? Oh, just very briefly, there was the question how many blazers are observed uh, using HES um, and on, on that website you can quite nicely um, get an overview of those. Okay, Eli, please go ahead. Okay, great. Um, so, over 200 very high energy sources have been observed, as I said earlier, both galactic and extragalactic. Um, maybe for people that might not know what that means, that means that within our galaxy and outside of our galaxy. Um, so of those 200 plus sources that were observed, uh, very high energy sources that were observed, AGN make up 40% of those. Um, there's a catalog that we usually check which um, um, uh, sort of records uh, as this number increases, as the number of observations of high, very high energy sources are uh, 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 keep, keeps on increasing, the catalog gets updated. So three quarters of this, 40% of AGN are actually highly uh, high, high frequency peak PL lacks, uh, which are basically blazers. The rest are uh, flat spectrum radio quasars, LBLs, IBLs, and UHPLs. I'll talk about these things on the next slide or perhaps on the second slide. Right now, just bear with me. Um, so very high observations of empty galaxies. What, 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 does, what does this actually mean for us? What it means for us is that we have a unique tool uh, when, we, when, this conduct, when these types of observations are conducted to probe the physics of extreme environments just as uh, Mariana mentioned, with these observations, we can learn about the accretion physics. You know, uh, we can learn about jet formation because we still are unsure exactly how that process happens. And we can learn about the interaction of the black hole magnetosphere with the accretion disk corona that surrounds the black hole. Um, and we can learn about other relativistic interaction processes and so forth. There's quite a lot of things that can be learned about, um, um, about these objects with these types of observations. Um, so now on to talking about what those IBLs and FSRQs that I talked about on the previous slide. Um, so the blazer SEDs or the spectral energy distribution, this is basically just um, this uh, spectral, uh, or this, uh, this plot here, this is what's called this, the spectral energy distribution, which basically uh, encompasses the entire EM spectrum. Um, the, the, such a distribution for blazers is dominated by non-thermal emission, which means um, no, um, Temperature is not a function, or, or heat is, is not a function of this, this type of emission. And that consists of two distinct 
broad components. As you can see, you can clearly see there are two components that are involved um, in these types of uh, um, spectral energy distributions. So um, you have a low energy component, which ranges from radio through UV all the way up to X-rays. And then you have a high energy component. Uh, it's like David was talking about that uh, um, in his comment. High energy component which goes from X-rays to gamma rays. Um, and now you have a subdivision of blazers into several types. And this is determined by the location of the peak. So the low frequency part that you saw in that blue diagram there um, has a peak. Depending on where that peak is located in terms of frequency, um, gives um, a, um, a places a certain blazer into a certain division. So Eli, could you go back to that uh, picture again and and, and and just show us an example of uh, that subdivision if if it is there. Yeah, um, I actually have a picture next uh, in the next slide, or is it two slides from here? Okay, um, this is a similar picture. So I just maybe maybe if I can propose this, can you can people just hold on to these numbers for me for now, and then we will we will we will look at what this means on the on the slide in the next um, uh, or rather on the on the second slide from this one. Does that sound fine or do you insist I go back to the, no, to that's the fine. previous that's fine, thank you. Okay, great. So that's the subdivision. So um, you have the low synchrotron peaked blazers, so abbreviated to LSP blazers, which have a uh, peak of the, of the low frequency component um, le being less than 10 to the 14 hertz, which means this type of uh, blazer peaks in the infrared regime. So examples of these are the uh, flat spectrum radio quasar, FSRQ, and the low frequency peaked BLX, BLX objects. All right, which we abbreviate to LBLs. Then you have the intermediate synchrotron peaked uh, blazers, abbreviated to ISP, and those have their peak frequencies for the low ICD component between 10 to the 14 hertz and 10 to the 15 hertz, okay, which is basically in the optical to the UV regime. Example of those are low frequency peaked, uh, uh, low frequency peaked BLX again, and intermediate um, uh, peaked BLX. All right. Then there's the high high signatron peaked uh, group, HSP. So and that has a peak frequency of over 15 hertz, which is in the X-ray uh, X-ray regime. So almost all high frequency peak BLX fall in this category of those three quarters of the 200 plus uh, that we have would fall in this category, all right? So then we have what's called um, the traditional blazer sequence, which basically states that Overall, so this sequence was, uh, was, uh, was done by some researchers back in the day, Fossati et al, uh, 1998, I think it was. So they used 126 blazers and, and they binned them into five, logger, uh, five bins. And this is what they came up with. And what they, what they noticed was that um, Overall, decreasing bolometric luminosity as well as decreasing gamma ray dominance happens along the sequence as you go from flat spectrum radio quasar to um, low frequency peaked BLAC object to a high frequency peak BLAC object. What you find is that the bolometric luminosity, in other words, the total luminosity over the entire um, energy range or the entire frequency range decreases, all right? So 
With that in mind, frequency, uh, flat spectrum radio quasars are therefore expected to have strong gamma ray dominance because then as you go from uh, the lower frequency to the high frequency, if bolometric ma uh, magnitude decreases or bolometric luminosity decreases, then you expect uh, FSRQs to have to peak in the in the in the in the gamma ray um, regime, or to or to have a high flux or high luminosity in the gamma ray regime, and then you expect the high frequency peaked uh, blazers to have to to be synchrotron dominated. What that means is that between the two regimes, the low frequency regime and the high frequency regime, the peak for the gamma ray, uh, the high peak, uh, high peak, high frequency peak uh, gamma uh, uh, blazers rather, would be higher in the lower frequency and lower in the high frequency, and the other way around for the flat spectrum radio quasar. Now there's a problem with that, with, with this traditional sequence, because that actually is not what is observed for some of these objects. So, um, for example, as you go from this object to this object, and then this one and this one, this is an FSRQ. According to the traditional blazer sequence, it, it should peak, the, the two peaks, the one in the high energy regime should be higher. That's fine. As you go to the intermediate peaked, uh, frequency peaked blazer, the, 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 the lower frequency bit should be higher than the high frequency peak, and that's fine, and we see that. And now the problem comes here. This is a, an, an, inter, an intermediate frequency peaked blazer, and what we expect is that its high energy component, the, its high energy SED component, is supposed to be lower than its low energy peak component. So we don't understand what's going on here. So that traditional sequence has, has broken down here, and we do not know for sure what the reasons are, okay? So um, here we see um, this is a high frequency peaked laser and, and, and it conforms to the traditional sequence. The low frequency bit peak is higher than the high energy uh, SED component peak. So, um, so there, here we have a problem and we do not understand. It's one of the, one of the puzzling um, observations that we have, we, we just cannot pinpoint for sure what the cause of that is. Right, um, are there any questions perhaps or comments before I move on? Are there, are there, any, are there any comments in the chat? Who is there perhaps, anybody? Eli, the, the y-axis here is, uh, is, is the luminosity of the blazer? Yes. Or the energy, rather. Okay. Um, it's the energy. Okay. Uh, it, uh, can I ask one question? Yes, sure, please. please. Uh, so, can we like uh, control the uh, gamma ray variability of those, like the blazer sources? Can we control that process? I don't think we can do that. The variability of the blazer sources, like? Um, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question very well. Because, uh, uh, so, well how, how do you mean control the var variability? Like to, 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 like to know about the, the variability of the blazer source based on the gamma ray, the gamma ray variability of these blazer sources. Um, what I can say is that we, we, we have no control over what these things can do and how they can vary, but I think I, I have a feeling I'm not understanding the question very well. Is there anybody maybe in the audience that, that's understanding that, that can answer that? So the gamma ray from like the blazers, they have high energetic uh, gamma ray. 
So yes. can, can we study this, the variability, like by, uh, because they are high energetic uh, sources. So can we study this, the variability of these sources? Can we, can, sorry, can we do what with the variability of the source? Sorry, can you repeat that part again? So we can study the variability of AGM. Yes. Mm -hmm. so, so they have like high energetic uh, X-ray and the gamma ray sources. Those, uh, yeah, they emit, they emit yeah, very high in those regimes, yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. So can we study this uh, high gamma ray variability sources? like uh, the, the, yep. the gamma variability awesome. from yeah you means can we study can we study them yes can, can, can we study, study the variability yeah because yes, they have we... energetic but can we study those sources like their variability yeah i'm 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 sure you know if you gather data and you have um the spectral energy distribution you can study and and model and fit the data to the models and see what the, the models are saying. Uh, the, 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 maybe, maybe uh, Dejen, can you maybe hold on to that question so that I can talk about blazer models yeah. and then, and then, and then we, we can, can come back. About model. We can yeah. study about their, like we can study those sources based on model, but Observationally, mm -hmm. can we study about their variability, the, the gamma ray variability? Yeah, I mean, if you, if you take some data, um, you can look for patterns and you can compare to what you had before. Uh, if you have some data of the source from the past, it's from some observations that you made in the past, you can check, you know, from the, the luminosity or from the brightness, if there are any changes, and obviously, if the, the you know if there is a change, you 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 then you you can you can notice the patterns and things like this. You can study um, the variability in that sense. Okay. I mean, you uh, how do you pick up variability? You pick up variability because you have previous data in your in your records you measured the luminosity to be this much or your energy to be this much, whatever unit you are using to, to measure this. Um, and then later on, you come back and you observe the same source again, and you see that actually the variability has dropped by, you know, um, whatever amount, by some factor. And then you, you come back again a week later and you do the observation again, and you, you, you see that it has changed. And, and you can go on like that and you can basically cut, uh, 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 record all those results and you can study variability in that way. So Eli, is variability a change in the um, emission in, in the spectra? Luminosity. Pretty much. The, is it, it's a change, it, it's a yeah. change in, the, in, the light, in, the, in, the, in the light curve. I mean, if you're doing, Over if time. You're doing imaging, it's a change. Yes. Okay. And f I understand for blazers that change happens quite quickly. From what yes, I it can happen. It can happen on time scales of hours. Uh, it can happen on time, time. I think it can also happen on time scales of minutes. If my, if 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 my memory serves me well, but it can also happen on time scales of you know, months, weeks, um, and so forth. Maybe years as well. Okay, let's go on, please. All right. Um, okay, so what do we have? Uh, now on to bla blazer emission models. Um, so these two components that we have, the lower frequency component, the high frequency component, um, 
These components are modeled, you know, as usual with anything that you do in science, you basically have a model that you try to fit data to. And um, so the leptonic model that tries to reproduce this kind of uh, uh, spectral energy distribution assumes that the radiative output of the blazer across the entire EM spectrum is dominated by leptons, electrons and possibly positrons. Now, for the high energy uh, component, the high energy emission, um, the leptonic model explains that, that, that part of the emission by Compton scattering of low energy photons by the same electrons that produce the synchrotron emission for the low, the low SED component. Okay, because the emission, the synchrotron emission, um, which is basically um, an electron gyrating around the magnetic field, the, the process releasing uh, the energy, the emission. So these same electrons, according to the leptonic model, are what is are what are what are responsible for the scattering of low energy photons to produce the to produce this part um, of of the emission so people in the uh, the community the high energy community laser community specifically they're quite um, they, they, they generally accept that this low uh, SED components is produced by synchrotron emission um, of 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 um, electrons and, and possibly pro, uh, 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 positrons, but the, the the differences and the 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 debate comes on the high energy component. So there are some observations that. Um, I don't seem to conform to the leptonic model when it comes to the high energy component. Oh geez, I have leptonic and leptonic model. I'm supposed to have hadronic model here. <laughs> Please forgive me. <laughs> so uh, now in the hadronic model, um, the low frequency part is still dominated by synchrotron emission from um, primary electrons, which could also include positrons, but the high energy bit, this bit, um, that the hadronic uh, 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 mod, uh, um, our model does not uh, think that it's, it does not basically treat that in the same way that the leptonic model does. But what it assumes is that the high energy emission is dominated by proton synchrotron emission um, and piezo decay of photons, synchrotron and Compton emission from secondary decay, products of charged ions, and the output from pair cascades initiated by these high energy emissions. Um, this is a whole lot of inputs to this model. So the two models, basically this, this is what they predict and that standing here is that you know, our current observations cannot actually distinguish, you know, for sure which model should be correct. Um, so this current, the, the leptonic and the hadronic model are currently the, the, the widely used module, uh, models for modeling the SED for both the low, um, low component and the high component um, parts. And you can get a mixture between the two of them, um, which is another version of the model. And there are other models that also try to, to uh, model the ultra high frequency peaked blazers, which I didn't include in the example that I gave. Now, the question is, how do we proceed, you know, given this deadlock? Because observational data at the moment cannot seem to discriminate between or among all these models. So CTA, the Cherenkov Telescope Array, is actually um, being looked at as one of the, 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 um, 
the solutions to these problems, to these modeling problems that we currently face uh, with the blazer emission models. So CTA will be able to provide high quality spectra um, that can actually discriminate and verify whether all these inputs to the hadronic model are actually what they uh, are actually what what they should be, or the leptonic model is really uh, stand by its predictions. So, a combination of CTA high, high quality spectra and redshifts from telescopes like SALT and other optical telescopes and observations in other electromagnetic um, uh, bands, UV, X-rays, infrared, is really what's going to kind of uh, nail these models and discriminate amongst them and uh, so rule Eli, out some explain a little bit, uh, you know, what is CTA, what, uh, when would they start taking data and stuff, and how does it go beyond the uh, hair, so what is the overlap, if any, right. and so forth. Yeah, so uh, in this diagram here, but maybe, maybe before I talk about this diagram, let me just go back quickly to explaining what CTA is. Um, just give me a moment, I will spring back to, okay, so, this is the Cherenkov Telescope Array, CTA. Um, so it'll have these three different types of telescopes. Um, it'll have this uh, medium, uh, small size telescopes and those will be 17 and they are strictly going to be built in the Southern Hemisphere. And then um, there will be this medium sized telescopes, which will be 40 in total. And these are kind of the mirror diameters of these telescopes. And then there will be the large size telescopes. So the, uh, the medium size will be split both between the Northern and the Southern hemisphere. And then the large size telescopes as well will be split between the Northern and the Southern hemisphere. Um, so this in principle is CTA. And now the kind of energies that it can go to uh, to bring up that diagram very quickly. So at the moment, Fermi can observe um, up to these energies. If it was observed for a week, it, it can observe and reach that kind of limit. Now CTA, is able to observe um, up to lower energies. Four or five hours, it can reach those kinds of energies. All right. So here is an illustration. Here is just an illustration of the kind of sens sensitivities that CTA can reach um, compared to Fermi, for example, which is a space-based telescope, a gamma ray telescope. Fermi observes for one week, CTA observed for 50 hours, and it can reach this kind of unprecedented accuracy. With the observational um, uh, frequencies, um, yeah, I think uh, Michael must help me out here. I can't remember now. I think it's observing from, um, is it 300 GeV up to, um, beyond TV energy ranges, uh, whereas Fermi at the moment observes at lower energies. So there's a, there's an overlap between um, um, has has observational uh, uh, frequency range, but CTA is going to go to lower energies as well. That has is unable to go to and any other ground-based Cherenkov telescope at the moment is unable to go to. 
So that's kind of the, the, um, the operational mode of CTA. Uh, when when CTA will you start telescope. taking data? Is it already um, or is it still coming? CTA? No, no, no. It, it's not operational yet. It's yet to be constructed. So not in the next five years, I think. I mean, I, I don't know. There are always delays with these things and politics and, and whatnot. I'm, I'm not the one to say, but I think, I can't remember the, what the documentation says, when exactly it will come online. I, I didn't um, have a look at, at, at those dates, but um, I don't think next, uh, I don't think in, in the next five years, not, not, not after five years from now, but there, there are people here online who can uh, maybe uh, give some answers about that. Um, uh, I don't know if uh, Isaac is still around here. Hambe? Hambe, when is CTA coming online? Isaac? Um, neither Hambe nor Isaac, but um, I think the five years that you mentioned are quite, um, quite close to what, what people have in mind currently. So I think data taking is a to start 2025 not well in the in the end you own, <laughs> only know when it's done not there right and where is CTA going to be located I, I, okay the southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere, hemisphere which, which country are hosting these species the southern hemisphere site is um, uh, in Chile and then the northern hemisphere side is the Canary Islands okay. uh, on La Palma. Yeah. Uh, people can correct me if I have forgotten that. But um, uh, so it's Chile in um, South America and um, the Canary Islands. Um, so are there perhaps uh, any other questions? Um, anyway, maybe let me just finish up. I'm about to actually finish, then we can enter the discussion ses session. It's actually 5.30 now. Right. Um, so what will CTA do? CTA will basically um, produce observations to the lowest of energies. It'll, pro it'll um, produce um, high um, um, high resolution um, uh, images and, and high resolution uh, spectra. So combined with redshifts, so one thing I must, I must mention here about redshifts is that um, a telescope like CTA and any other telescope that might be operating in the gamma ray regime at the moment, um, is unable to determine how far the gamma ray, or the, or the not the gamma ray, but the blazer that it's looking at from uh, from 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 the observer from the observer's point. So this is why CTA uh, relies on telescopes like Southern African Large Telescope and the CAC telescopes in Hawaii and uh, some other optical telescopes uh, at the ESO facilities in South America to actually take spectral redshifts. You can see the importance of redshift from this diagram. If you don't know what the redshift is, you actually won't know what the shape is supposed to look like. Um, you, you will not know what the shape, but the spectral energy distribution of this object is supposed to look like. If you, if, because if you observe at redshift 0 0.1, this is what the spectrum looks like, would look like. Um, not the spectrum, but the spectral energy distribution, in essence, it is a spectrum, would look like. Despite you doing your modeling very well and all of that, your redshift information will determine that this is what your spectrum is going to look like. And if you observe that redshift three, this is what the spectrum is going to look like. So without redshift information, you're kind of actually blind on what the shape of the spectrum should look like. So that's just what I wanted to highlight here. 
that are very high quality spectra and or maybe before uh, before I move away from this point, it's to mention that this uh, another another aspect is this ex extra uh, galactic background light. Um, so the shape of your spectrum is actually um, it works in con in conjunction with with the influence of of the extra galactic background light, which is basically uh, light from you know stars first stars that formed and um, and light from AGN activities and all of that. So it's the it's the second largest uh, amount of background light in the universe after the cosmic microwave background. So knowing the redshift and having high quality spectra can actually also help you to constrain the density of the extra galactic background light. Okay, so I'm gonna stop here, I think. Uh, so that basically uh, was the end of it. So just to conclude and to summarize very quickly, a lot obviously is yet to be understood about AGN from what we've seen also from the lectures of Miriana and uh, high quality spectra that CTA will give us at various redshifts um, would be key for us to unravel the current mysteries uh, of blazer emission mechanisms. All right, so yeah, so that's, that's, the, that's the end of the lecture. So happy to start discussions now. Um, Eli, thank you very much um, for uh, this lecture, for actually being available uh, given all your other commitment and so forth. So this is really appreciated. And there were a number of questions uh, during the lecture itself, uh, but maybe people have uh, other questions or comments. Is there any question on the chat? Um, just. Uh, we should just speak up. While we have Eli, we should squeeze all information out of him before he, we let him go. So Eli, so at the moment, uh, the blazer data that you are using for your research, I mean, you like, you know, your group with Michael and so forth, uh, if you guys are doing the same line of uh, research, uh, yeah. Where do you get the data? Which, which telescope is supplying the, this data that you are using right now before CTA comes, uh, comes online? Oh, at, at the moment, the HES telescope takes data, but um, I must say, like I, I indicated at the beginning, that I, I was actually trained as, as an optical astronomer. So this is actually something that I'm only getting into now. At the moment, the kind of work I'm doing and also studying this type of work uh, on the side is um, work using the Southern African Large Telescope to take uh, um, uh, redshift measurements of blazer candidates. And those blazer candidates that I'm, I'm working with, together with Michael and other collaborators, those we get from the Fermi catalog, the space-based telescope that have taken observations of these things and they just create a catalog. It's out of, these objects are coming from that 200 plus sources that we, or some of them at least, are coming from that uh, group. And then the other objects that we take measurements with the Sol telescope with are actually coming from the Fermi catalog. Um, of the Fermi observations that have been made. My colleagues can also add to that, but I know um, uh, Michael and uh, Isaac and uh, Hambe, these guys are doing other work where they use um, HES data and they can comment on that. Yeah, I think it would be, be, be guys. yeah, it, it would be nice for you to comment on it, especially I mean, since Hess is in Namibia, um, um, it would be useful to tell us a bit about it and how 
uh, CTA will uh, complement, uh, uh, you know, has uh, has data uh, now, and what is the future of has when CTA comes along? Uh, so it would be nice if you right. can comment on that. I'll just, right. just take it from here, or do you want to start it like? No, no, no. I have actually said what I said. I think Katev is asking that we comment. Oh, sure, sure. All, well, it's, all of us, it's, uh, uh, go ahead. That, that, thanks, Katev. Those are all um, very, very, very good and actually quite important questions for um, in the context of the future of astronomy on the continent. Um, whereas on the other hand, the answers to that are um, are, are much less simple than, than, than the questions uh, may, may, may suppose. Um, so the, the, the point is, has, is currently, well, the HES telescopes have been erected, well, they have been started to be erected 20 years ago. Um, actually, just this September, uh, we, we had a, a very small celebration on 20 years of, of um, groundbreaking breaking for the first telescope. Um, so the HES telescopes are there and they are currently, well, they are run by an international collaboration and they are not run all by, by Namibia. Um, don't get a wrong impression there. They're run by an international collaboration of, of um, 200 plus scientists um, from 30 institutes in, in uh, I think, 12 or 13 countries. Um, most of those countries being in Europe, um, and Namibia, South Africa being involved, um, a few colleagues in Japan, a few co uh, colleagues in Australia. Um, so it's, 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 it's actually a big, big science instrument in that regard. Um, and a bit like with the big particle accelerator ex uh, experiments uh, that you know from CERN or, uh, for, or, or wherever, um, there typically is a pre-planned end of lifetime to those experiments because then the successors typically kick in and they shall, uh, they, and they typically make the predecessors sort of obsolete. Um, that is not exactly the case here, because as you heard, the Southern Array of CTA will be built in Chile, um, which is because of the rotation of our Earth actually eight hours behind in time compared to, um, to the African continent or to Namibia in particularly. Um, so has actually could, uh, could very well continue with a, uh, with a quite focused um, scientific scope um, for doing monitoring and alerting for CTA, um, for example, um, but also having the largest and even in the CTA era um, will be continuing to have the largest um, Trankov telescope um, in the world because the CDA telescopes will be in inverted commas only 24 meters by diameter whereas um, the large HES telescope is 30 meters in diameter. Um, so there is a very um, very distinctive set of science cases where the HES telescopes can be very nicely complementing um, the science that CTA will be doing besides the fact that CTA still needs, will still need something like five years before um, actually delivering data. Mm -hmm. um, but in the end, that's, that, that, that's a hard lesson to learn um, for all scientists. Um, and typically around about the, uh, the age that, that that's the attendees uh, of the African School of Physics are in, um, science is not just about science quite often, unfortunately, but quite often there's a big aspect in terms of, of money and funding coming into it. Um, and so in that regard, of, uh, of, well, sort of obviously, the future of HES is, is, is quite open and quite unclear um, at this stage because, well, we don't know yet if in five years' time um, this this group of um, 13 countries uh, is still willing to support the running of HES financially. Mm -hmm. um, we, we, we still have good hopes. Um, well, and currently we're 
we actually are approaching the next round of negotiations for the next three years of extension um, of running has. Uh, but, well, in the end, um, it often boils down to, to, to running these telescopes because there's a price tag to it. You need to have the people to maintain the telescopes, you have to people to take data, you have to, to um, well, you have to have the computing resources, which also need power, and then that uh, in terms um, need money to run them and so forth. So it's, yes, we, we, we are quite, um, quite positive that ha the HES telescopes shall certainly be, be running um, until CTA is online. Mm -hmm. I would uh, personally guess that there's um, enough support to also run it mm -hmm. into the CTA era. Uh, thank you, uh, Michael. Um, other questions, um, other comments? The journey. So you are you are in uh, in Chile. Are you are you involved in any any work directly related to the CTA? Uh, no, because I'm working. I'm using uh, optical telescope, okay. and also maybe probably I will use Alma mm -hmm. radio. So for now, I'm only using optical telescope. All this right. is only for the high range, like high energy. Okay. Yeah, sources. Other questions or comments for Eli? So Eli, what is the future of the SALT telescope in South Africa right now? Uh, that is also supplying some of the data. Um, it's been running concurrently with, uh, with HES. Um, how is the complementarity between those uh, those two, and, and and what do you see the future for that? Uh, if the city oh. area, and yeah, I think um, salt is going to continue playing a pivotal role in the whole thing, because um, actually with the program that we are doing at the moment, we have we have had quite um, uh, great success with uh, determining redshifts. So uh, as, I, as I mentioned in the talk, you know, um, you, you can do, um, CTA comes online and it, it can do all these great things, but it's still gonna need redshifts. So the most attractive uh, blazers that can be observed with CTA or even with HETS are the blazers that have redshift information. Mm -hmm. So SALT is going to continue playing that role and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the community in South Africa, uh, Michael mentioned, you know, HES is run by an international collaboration, lots of countries in Europe, South Africa is involved. So members, the, 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 South, the, South, the South African researchers that are involved in HES also make use of SALT to take redshifts of their sources. So SALT is going to continue playing this support role. And I, I, I think, you know, um, just looking from um, the kind of feedback we've had with running this uh, project of determining redshift or redshift information for blazers and, uh, you know, uh, other people are probably observing um, other, other AGN candidates with SALT as well. I'm not sure about that. But like we're specifically observing uh, blazers. The kind of feedback we've had is that the salt management or the salt tell us, uh, the salt, um, um, the salt uh, board represented by the, teles the salt telescope allocation committee are quite happy with the kind of results that we've produced so far. And, and I, know, I know salt is gonna continue running I mean, it's being well maintained. It's a well maintained telescope, um, and it's got a lot of uh, international support. So I think SALT is going to continue uh, playing a pivotal role in the in the study of blazers, specifically when it comes to measuring the redshifts. Okay. Um, other question? Other comments? So my colleagues that are connected here are Christine. Uh, 
Uh, Lawrence, uh, you guys maybe feel free to comment if you, if you want. Yeah, hi, hi hello, Ella. That's really nice to have uh, all this presentation and to see as well with uh, Michael, so all this good work that is uh, progressing. So thanks a lot for those presentations. So maybe one thing just to come back as well to what you were mentioning at the beginning as well, the importance of this uh, uh, data science intensive program. So all those big data that really for the SCA will be as well something important for Africa. So it's really good that you have this yeah. clear sky and for the infrastructure. So like with the, the haze that, uh, that we saw, but as well the capacity for the, the big computing uh, uh, high power capacity as well. I think it's something very important too, isn't it? As you mentioned. So it's, I guess, something complementary. Yeah. And this is something which makes it as well kind of more multi-physics as well, this domain that you are, that you are really uh, pushing through. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Christine, for the positive words. So we will, we will try our best to, con to continue and um, to push boundaries and uh, see where we can do any good that, that is to be done. Mm -hmm. um, I'm personally finding myself not having enough time for doing good things, but uh, we'll carry on, we'll see. I need, to, uh, I need a refresher course on time management and prioritization and things. <laughs> anyway, that's, that's kind of irrelevant. So this is beyond physics then, and so including management then. <laughs> so I, I have a quick question. It's true. Yeah, Lawrence, please. So I, I apologize, I was sort of multitasking. I was actually in another Zoom meeting while the the talk yeah. was going on, half kind of half listening to both. Um, but I wanted to ask about uh, space-based observations. So I, I know that you, I thought you mentioned SALT and HESS and CTA. Um, are you using any of the uh, space-based um, data sets that come from, from NASA, X, uh, NASA Fermi or uh, what's it, the XMM telescope? X-ray telescope? Yeah, that's right. Um, the, the objects that we are actually measuring, redshifts for, uh, the majority of those objects are actually coming from the Fermi LAD survey. Okay. Um, they were detected by Fermi some time ago. And this, this sample that we're producing not only with SOLT, but also with Keck and um, other optical telescopes, we, we are actually building this sample for C specifically for CTA. You know, when CTA comes online, then it's, uh, it, it'll then, you know, takes high quality spectra for a sample that's or that, that, that is already having redshift information, which, which, which will make it a special sample. I mean, the majority of the things that CTA will observe will not have redshifts. That's a given because spectroscopic redshifts are just difficult to find really. Um, but we're creating this special sample specifically for CTA. And this is going to be an interesting sample from where we can get, we are hoping to get some good, um, good uh, investigative results and, and good, hopefully which will lead to interesting discoveries in terms of physics, AGN physics and that sort of thing, yeah. What are the prospects for um, doing space-based astronomy in Africa? Because it seems like most of the African space agencies, even SANSA, they're more ba into uh, yeah. space-based ground observation instead of, uh, space-based astronomy. Is that uh, still the yeah, case? Uh, yeah. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, I'm not sure if I, <laughs> if I qualify to answer on this because it really depends on the political will of the people to put down resources and go into these type of things. But um, I know that um, Rwanda launched a satellite some time ago, but that's that's not for astronomy. I was for um, telecommunications, and Ghana did the same thing, but also not for astronomy. I I, I really don't know. I I won't. I don't know what to say, Lawrence. I, yeah. I don't think I have the answer to that. No, I don't know if Michael might. Michael and Isaac can uh, maybe Ambe have something to comment, or anybody else here. Um, 
if you know something, maybe you can comment. Just very briefly, Eli, I also don't have much, much inside there, but the point you raised is, is essentially the point um, I would have raised as well. Um, so African governments typically are interested in, um, in the satellite sector because there is um, a whole lot of money into the communication satellites, um, which they currently have to spend to, to foreign satellites, so to say. And so the idea is um, those who get their satellites up first and working can rent it to the uh, to the surrounding countries, so to say. Um, that's that's my my personal interpretation. Whereas on the other hand, space-based telescopes just cost huge amounts of money. Um, you you mentioned to yourself the, the, the Fermi um, Fermi satellite, and I, I, I might be wrong by, by by a factor of two or three or so. But I vaguely remember that that was in the 300 million US, if it wasn't even more. And so that's, that's quite substantial amounts of money. Um, so I have a question for you guys. I, um, the square kilometer array is also a series of radio telescopes, is that correct? Yes. So uh, what would be uh, its coverage and sensitivity with respect to uh, CTA, for example? Is that, has that been explored or is... Um, so the two telescopes are working at the opposite end of the extreme ends of the electro, of the EM spectrum. Um, but I know that they are both gonna be very sensitive um, I just don't, um, the, the SKA telescope is, is definitely going to play a big role in terms of um, observing the, the jets, you know, which are, which, which are picked up in radio um, uh, very well. Um, so, so jet physics and, and that kind of, that kind of uh, uh, physics will, will, will be well complemented by the square kilometer array while CTA handles the, um, the high energy part. So with, with that uh, two bump you know, um, uh, profile, the SED, so the radio, uh, the radio, the SKA will observe the, the lower frequency part uh, um, with very high sensitivity and high resolution. And then the, 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 the the CTA will, will observe the high energy part. Okay. Um, um, yeah. Very, very good. So both, I, both, will bring, both will bring a rich amount of information to, to, the, to the table, basically. Because so is Namibia going to be still, Namibia will be involved in the CTA as well? You guys are actively collaborating in there? Or? Yes. I think so, but uh, recently we got contacted by the CTA office and uh, I spoke to the country representative, our HOD Rian. Um, I think there's some paperwork that needs to be done to renew our membership okay. in the CTA. Mm. Um, yeah, so I don't know what the outcome of that is going to be. I don't know if we will be required to pay some money. But I think we, we, we will. Whether people are prepared to do it is a different story. Uh, but, um, but I'm involved in CTA. I don't know if the country, I don't know, I don't know if it means that if the country is, 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 is no longer a member to CTA, that the individual memberships may also get terminated. I'm not sure about that. Maybe Michael can comment on that. Well, it's about institutes more than about countries. Mm -hmm. um, and well, it, it, it should all be doable. And even in, in, in a worst case scenario, there's a fallback solution. So um, our, 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 so to say, personal future in CTA is not at stake. Okay. Um, very good. Um, anybody, any, anybody else has any questions or any comments? I know there are people connected here from Morocco, uh, Ethiopia, and they have uh, astrophysics program in those countries, and maybe they 
you want to say something to enrich our discussion? All right, so, so I think uh, uh, in that case, I suggest that we stop for now. We'll have an opportunity to have uh, Michael, uh, Eli, and Isaac over um, again in the future. Um, they hosted uh, the African School of Physics 2018 in Namibia, and it was really a pleasure working with them. So we hope to continue that uh, collaboration um in the future so uh thank uh, thank you eli for for, for the talk uh, michael thanks for for being uh, available and, and your contribution to the discussion that's really appreciated isaac as well thank you and i i suggest that we stop for now thanks everybody for your participation thanks katevi thanks everyone for showing up Oh, wait. Well, uh, yeah, okay. I think uh, <laughs> Eli is still here. I'm sorry, I uh, didn't see. There is a question here from Meiki if he's still around. Yeah, yeah. Um, Eli, uh, thank you very much for the lecture. It was really, really informative and I learned a lot. I wanted to ask, I mean, um, around one year ago, we saw it's like um, the uh, the, the, the fairest uh, picture of a black hole ever. Can you please tell us about how that, uh, how that has been done? I mean, how, how they produce uh, this, uh, this picture? <laughs> yeah, I mean, just briefly, if, if uh, I mean. Yes, uh, getting it, is this, you know, it's not getting it, is it? Um, yeah, no, I think, I think um, I, I, will, I will not, I don't want to talk about that, that because I have no knowledge. I, I, I'm not confident I have the knowledge, but I, I know Michael, Michael has, has understands how that works. Um, you are talking about the, the, the image of the M, M81 that was produced by the Event Horizon Telescope. Yeah. Are you about that one. Yeah, that was done with a radio telescope um which is how many telescopes are in that network about six six radio telescopes Source. yeah yeah um yeah so what they did i yeah they michael talk about that please i think uh i uh, before i say something wrong that's going on the recording <laughs> Just, just, just as a disclaimer, I'm also not an expert in uh, in, in radio astronomy neither. Um, so, to, to take it all with a grain of salt. Um, okay. So the, um, the 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 thing that you can do well, it's, it 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 comes from very very basic optics principles. Actually, um, there is something which is called the diffraction limit. Um, which says that the angular resolution that you can achieve, well, angular resolution meaning um, how close can two spots get until you cannot discern them as two points anymore, uh, but only see one point. Um, yeah. So the, 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 there's a very, very fundamental optics concept, which is called the fraction limit, and which tells you that well, your resolution power, um, so uh, of resolving two spots as being separate, depends on the frequency of your observation and on the diameter of your observing instrument. Well, typically a telescope in the astronomical context. So what, what, what people have done over the last 20 years or so is actually trying to observe the shadow um, of supermassive black holes, mostly of, of our personal one in, our, in the center of our Milky Way, um, but also of M87, a very close by um, active galaxy. And what people have, have, have realized over time is that they need to increase the frequency they are observing, well, radio waves, we're still talking radio waves, but increasing the frequency 
um, of up to, what is that, 230 gigahertz they're currently observing, I think. So that's, um, that's roughly one millimeter, a bit less, I think 0 0.8 millimeter wavelength. Um, so microwave or millimeter wave radio astronomy, you could say. And to increase the size of the telescope. In yeah. radio astronomy, you can very nicely do that by what is called interferometry. So you use telescopes which are actually far away from each other. Um, but make sure that you have extremely accurate timing recording. So you know exactly the time that you're observing. So then you can actually inter um, interfere um, the, the, the recorded wave fronts um, afterwards digitally. Um, and so they used telescopes on the South Pole, on Hawaii, um, in the European Alps, um, in, in, in Chile. Alma was mentioned um, by another colleague. And put those data together, well, it's, it's literally many, many, many terabytes uh, that they had to fly um, to the two cor correlator stations, one at, uh, one at MIT, one in, uh, one in Germany, at the Max Planck yeah. Institute. And um, with, with literally a telescope as large as the Earth, um, by having those telescopes spaced so far on different continents, um, they could have enough resolution to actually see the bright accretion disk around the black hole, because that, that, that's literally what you see. And even to see um, the central, or well, that's, that, that's the orange ring in the, in, in the image that you have in mind, and to see the, um, the black part at the center of the image. Um, and that was actually the great achievement, to, not, not the ring so much, but really that there is a hole in the ring, because that means they could actually resolve uh, the shadow of the black hole. Yeah. Okay, excellent. Um, you, thank you. Information. Thank you, and sorry for, I mean, asking after. Uh, no, no, that's fine. I think we are discussing this. Uh, all the questions are welcome, and if we can answer, we answer. If we cannot answer, then we have to study more. So uh, thanks everybody, uh, thanks Michael again, and uh, Eli as well, Christine, um, Lawrence, and everybody. So uh, let's stop for now and continue the discussion online or other forums. So bye everyone. Thank you, bye everyone. Bye and thanks for the explanation. <laughs>